it's historically been chalked up that the differences between men and women are size differences, but but I think there are differences in gene expression that play a much greater role than 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 size, which then leads to this next question, which is okay, so you've got two people who both weigh eighty five kilos, right? So their size is comparable, their body composition uh, is is similar enough. It, let's even grant that they are metabolically comparable in health. They can have two very different responses and susceptibilities to alcohol. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people listening who think, well, I'm one of those people who can drink a lot and it doesn't seem to have an effect on me. Does that mean that alcohol is less toxic to me? So I'll, I'll, I'll give you my biases because a lot of people think that toxicity is only occurring at the level of the liver. Um, and we see in our, especially post-transplant, post-reformed alcohol use, the effects on the brain, the effects on the heart, the effects on the pancreas, um, there's a panoply of organs that can be affected by um, what's considered normal or moderate, less than moderate alcohol intake. Um, and so how someone is considering themselves not affected is also really important. Um, there's, of course, the psychosocial components as well. Um, and then the big one that that I think a lot of people are failing to talk about, I know the World Health Organization came out with um, sort of consensus statements in 2023, is the oncologic potential, DNA disruption, um, and how to measure that and how to mitigate some of those risks. So I think if, if someone's subjectively saying, I don't feel affected from a, a central nervous system perspective, they don't feel like their sensorium is altered, you know, sensorium for us, when we, when we grade hepatic encephalopathy, it could be, there are some mood changes that happen. Um, and so the CNS, um, either depressant effects or, um, removal of inhibitions, um, those, those, some of those effects are also, I think, socially acceptable CNS related effects, but they're, they're effects. And I'm sure you get asked this question all the time at parties, um, which is the, you know, you know, at what point does the dose of ethanol in grams per day or per week start to become problematic? So again, uh, this is a topic we've we've written about at length, um, which is that there's you know we we kind of reject the data that says that there's a J curve, right? So we we have not internally been convinced by the J curve data, which is largely epidemiologic and largely you know, suggests that at very low doses, I, or at zero alcohol is actually slightly worse than some alcohol. And then of course the risk goes up as drinks go up, but there's some sweet spot, which depending on the study can be actually quite high, um, for alcohol consumption to produce the lowest all cause mortality. Um, again, there are many ways to explain those, those, those data that I think are a, a better explanation than alcohol is good for you at some dose. I think the Mendelian randomizations point to the opposite, which is a monotonic change in risk that increases uh, consistently from zero and upward. But of course, this dose is still nonlinear. This risk is nonlinear with dose, I should say. And it begs the question then for, for people who want to choose to drink responsibly, at what point do you say the risk is probably too great? Uh, if we're not going to be complete abstainers, at what point do you tell somebody that's a little too much? It's a loaded question because I'm thinking about more than the liver, um, even though they might be approaching me with um, a liver centric point of view. So um, if there's evidence of injury um, and injury, so the way that we liver doctors think about it, our markers of necroinflammation, AST and ALT are not functional. They're markers of, of injury. And we think of much more uh, meaningful things in terms of being functional, albumin, synthetic function, uh, in terms of coagulation, and then also glucose handling. So if you start to see, I have, and again, with the patients that we see, we have many patients that have a degree of hepatic steatosis and their only risk factor is alcohol intake. And if they're not having any dysregulated metabolism, they're not distressed by this abnormality and we're able to monitor them and the net gain to them from all sorts of inputs, including social inputs, um, is that their alcohol level is not causing you know, major life events, including effects on their family or things that maybe um, are harder to talk about, then there's sort of a permissivity to that. 
Um, but it's just like supplement use. At some point, contaminated supplements or unknown supplements may cause evidence of liver injury. So with an openness to, can you give this up if it becomes problematic, either physiologically to the liver, to another organ, to relationships, et cetera. So that's sort of how we counsel people point in time. We also have all sorts of ways of looking at problematic, you know, use disorders that the big driver for all liver diseases, uh, parenchymal liver diseases, um, is what is sort of the behavior and the motivation behind engaging some of these things. And that's how the relational component with understanding why someone is doing what they're doing can really make a big impact because two or five years down the road, when you ask them to give it up, because there's a new breast cancer diagnosis, the risk of breast cancer is higher than the than the risk of liver disease for most women who are consuming alcohol. So if they have a new cancer diagnosis and we're asking them to give it up in that instance, or the, the patient bring, themselves brings it up in terms of what disease modifying um, changes can I make, can I implement in order to improve my lifespan? Um, those are things that we that we need to go back to. What was the origin? you know, what's the desire um, in terms of engaging some of these behaviors. What I've discovered is that humans are far more likely um, to give up something that they don't find beneficial, um, at least in our, in our, in my 14 years, 13 years of taking care of liver patients. Let's, let's use a specific example. So you have an individual that comes to you and says, um, I, I, you know, I consume alcohol socially, um, and if you go and talk to my friends, family, children, they would all tell you it's not a problem in my alcohol consumption, M meaning it, th there's no, there's no unintended consequence that is negative, right? It's all pro-social beneficial. Mm -hmm. Um, and they, you know, they have a normal liver synthetic function, which again, you would expect that's a pretty late finding if they don't. Um, their transaminases are normal. Again, we're going to come back to this. So I want to put a pin in that for everybody. We're going to explain in much more detail what transaminases are and what normal is. Um, you know, you mentioned toxicity to other organs in as much as we can assert, you know, that, that normal kidney function, normal cardiac function, all those other things. Do you say, look, the most sensitive indicator I have that you might be drinking too much are your transaminases and as long as those stay below a threshold, which you're going to tell me, and all of these other factors look okay, I'm all right with you drinking two glasses of wine in the evening. Or are you still saying, look, there are still things I can't measure. Be you know, and and even normal transaminases don't give me a good enough confidence that you are not causing irreversible harm here. So I wouldn't use amino transferases as a good marker. Um, I think more often we use a bedside imaging technique, the vibration controlled transient elastography, because the sensitivity of picking up on hepatic steatosis is higher than mm. something. It actually takes quite a bit of derangement and problematic mm. drinking to derange your amino transferases. So, and, and when you start to see fat accumulation in the liver, early warning sign potential mm -hmm. um, downstream metabolic consequences, potential inflammatory consequences, doesn't mean that they have to give it up. But I think it really tattoos to the patient in their experience that there, there are measurable effects of even moderate, you know, what's considered social and, and what's considered social is very, very variable. There's, you know, some of these, that's why it is good. I, I, for the audience members that are clinicians quantifying the use, especially now during and post pandemic, um, there have been just like the ALT has been perturbed based on environmental, you know, changes in our in our population. So it has sort of the definitions of moderate use. Um, so just going through that with patients can sometimes give you a little bit more inf information about um, how they're perceiving their risk. Which is obviously, if you're if you're counseling someone about the impact to their life um, and whether or not something would be wise to continue or not, you have to understand, you know, how they're perceiving risk. How do you ask people specifically about that? I, 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 we we ask patients, you know, uh, on average, how many drinks do you have in a given week, and what's the variance of that? I, I assume there's a much smarter way to ask this question. I'm so glad you're asking. Um, 
So first of all, we define what alcohol is. Oftentimes what has happened is one drink might be double the quantity that we're used to seeing. And so concentrations, so I say one and a half ounces of hard liquor, five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer is considered a standard drink. So that in and of itself gets some raised eyebrows from people because they don't know about those quantities. Um, so when we, and then I say, you know, ballpark, Oftentimes people will say, I don't have a problem with drinking. I don't drink every day. Um, and daily drinking at a certain threshold, you know, we consider um, two drinks per day for men, one drink per day for women, and these are standard drinks, um, what's considered the CDC definition of moderate alcohol intake. Um, a lot of younger people don't drink daily. Um, that's, a, that's a gross assumption, but it's much more of a binge type um, picture. And so quantity over what period of time for those standard drinks is also what we ask. Um, and then I also ask, you know, what's going on in these situations that you feel, is it, is it you're with family gathered over the weekend? Um, is it at home? Um, in the pandemic, it was a lot of um, isolated drinking at home. Um, and so that's where we started to see some of the biochemical changes, some of the imaging-based changes, and then more importantly, some of the social changes that happened with um, problematic drinking. Because the the slope can can vary um, without an individual being aware. So I think it is important to, to quantify it. And then the other the other test that we oftentimes do as liver specialists is we we measure sort of the longer range metabolite, something called phos phosphatidylethanol. Um, or a PET. Um, and that measures, you know, not just it's a little bit more like an A1C um, than, an, than a rapid identifier, like an ethyl glucuronide. Um, but it gives us an idea of, and it, it's graded in terms of moderate versus severe. And sometimes that gives you an aspect, uh, another angle to interview a patient. And again, there's, there's a lot of shame around alcohol use and what's going on in an individual at times. And so when you see really severe, heavy alcohol use, but a self-report of something far less severe, it's again, an opportunity to, to figure out what's going on.